game is to be where you are, be it honestly and as consciously as you know how. Watch the latest Ram Dass documentary film, Becoming Nobody, on Gaia.com. Of course, there was fear in losing that familiar identity. But there was always also wonder. The Gaia.com library supports you with transformational content. See it for yourself and go to Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and check out the Be Here Now playlist curated just for you. Visit Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and start your free trial today. Welcome to the Meta Hour with Sharon Salzberg, where Buddhist wisdom meets everyday life. This podcast is brought to you by the Be Here Now Network and features interviews with the top leaders, teachers, and thinkers of the mindfulness movement and beyond. For more information, visit BeHereNowNetwork.com backslash Sharon. Hi, this is Sharon. And what we're doing for this particular broadcast is we're rebroadcasting a podcast that I had the chance to record in December of 2018 with Ruth King, who had just had a book come out called Mindful of Race. And I would highly recommend that you consider her book if you don't already have it, because I think it may be a, a really good resource for you. I have a book coming out September 1st, and that was postponed from June 2nd. And what that delay has brought me to is a nearly constant reflection on what's still true in this time of upheaval and displacement and rage and fear and anguish and so many things. You know, I've been really doing a very deep inquiry, like what's still true for me fundamentally? Like what gives me a sense of guidance or or what can I lean on in moving forward? And it came to me so strongly that the things Ruth said which were so brilliant and important then, or maybe even more important now, are something that we all can actually rely on. So we decided to just offer you this again. Hi, I'm Sharon Salzberg, and I'm talking today with Ruth King. Ruth is an international teacher in the Insight Meditation tradition and an emotional wisdom author and life coach. Ruth's work blends mindfulness principles and meditation with an exploration of our racial conditioning, its impact, and our potential. She is the author of several publications, including Healing Rage, Women Making Inner Peace Possible, and her most recent release, Mindful of Race, Transforming Racism from the Inside Out. Welcome, Ruth. Thank you so much, Sharon. It's lovely. It's great to at least speak to you. We're trying to figure out before we <laughs> began recording how long it's been since we've actually seen each other. It's been a while. It's been a while, I think, yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm wondering if you could start with um, a little bit of what first brought you to the path of meditation and and then when you first started teaching. Yeah. Um, well, I, I came into this... Um, practice. I I don't know if I was looking for this practice as much as I feel like it was looking Mm -hmm. for me or that it's kind of always been in the mix. And I just started uh, tuning in more to uh, just some of the subtle ways the practice was uh, really a part of um, um, a return, I guess you could say. And uh, this was all happening in the late 80s. In fact, I um, went to China and I met Dr. Marlon, Marlene Jones Schoonover. Uh, uh, we were both staring at this, you know, five-story golden Buddha somewhere mm-hmm. in China at the Women's World Conference. And only two black women in there with long dreadlocks and tears running down our eyes in silence. And she turned to me and she says, you know, where do you live? And sillyly, you know, I said, I live in the Bay Area as if everybody in China would know where that is. Mm -hmm. Uh, But anyway, uh, we found out we were in the same area and uh, that uh, she invited me to come to Spirit Rock. And she was on the board at the time, and um, I said, I'm really not. She said, do you meditate? And it's like, well, not really. Mm -hmm. Um, 
But she invited me to come. I came on a Monday night. I listened to one of Jack's talks, who was her teacher, and I kind of fell in love with the practice. It was such a recognition uh, of something very deep, um, deeply known. And I think what really got me was it was uh, this idea in this practice of knowing for yourself and not um, relying on something external to mm-hmm. um, recognize what freedom and ease was. And that was real uh, radical for me at the time because I had been doing so much work in race and racism and uh, diversity inside of corporations mostly. Uh, but this was a piece that was missing. This was the piece that supported me in working with my own inner distress in a very profound way. So... I, that's how I got started, and I, uh, I I I studied with Jack for a number of years. We were in a ten-year sangha together that was organized by um, Alice Walker mm-hmm. in the Bay Area, mm-hmm. and so we met monthly um, as a wisdom circle for ten years. And then it was from there that he invited me to teach, and um, I, and I've been teaching ever since. So. That's been since, I think it was around 2005, 2006, I started teaching. Uh, and, and in this period of time, I also tasted into some of the Tibetan practices. I worked with a Tibetan teacher for about six years in the Dzogchen tradition, and, the, uh, and also just felt a real resonance in the Mahayana tradition and did a bit of study there with Pema Shroden. But um, I mostly feel like the... Um, insight tradition, especially the four foundations, which is such a beautiful mechanism for kind of decolonizing or deconstructing Mm -hmm, the mind mm -hmm. and kind of staying in the heart body, was just really a a very potent medicine, I think, for uh, the work that I do, what matters for me in the world in a socially engaged way. And being able to do that with a sense of um, uh, stability, equanimity, e- inner ease, so that I'm aware of the impact my actions are happening more, you know, more systemically. So that's kind of how I stepped into mm-hmm. this and some of the ways that really feeds me and supports me serving more wisely. So by four foundations, we should just say you mean the four foundations of mindfulness, the four arenas of yeah exploration yeah. or discovery. Yeah, and just kind of deconstructing and working with just how you think and mm-hmm. how you um, navigate things, yeah. So do you still work with corporations and diversity and inclusion? Well, I'm working less with corporations. Um, well, actually, I'm starting to see more invitations there. But for the last several years, I've been working mostly with sangha, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. leadership bodies that are looking at how to recognize the leadership role in including an inclusion and um, uh, working with issues of power and mm-hmm. inclusion and equity inside of sanghas and, um, and, and leaders and teachers that are trying to figure out the role they have in the seat that they sit in as a teacher to influence an environment that supports uh, inclusion through their own example. So those are some of the things that I've been interested in. I work with um, meditation practitioners that are trying to understand more around race and racism. I work with activists who are trying to understand and incorporate more mindfulness practices mm-hmm. into their <laughs> activism. And I work with a lot of uh, spiritual people just in general from uh, other traditions that are looking at how they embody their uh, beliefs in ways that show up well in the world, especially around um, race and racism, Mm -hmm. just seeing their role in it. And I also work with artists that are, I I just think there's a beautiful component of artistry that supports well-being. The way I talk about it in the book is artistry is cultural medicine. Mm, and nice. when we're when we're in the soup of really trying to figure out what our contribution is, uh, coming at it through a lens of you know where do you find yourself 
creatively expressing uh, is one way that we can really show up in the world authentically, genuinely, and to be able to do, to do that well, I think is very related to a mindfulness practice. So in, in your book, your new book, um, it's always nice to be able to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, your right? New book, um, <laughs> in your new book, you talk about uh, individual systems and group dynamics that lead to racial imbalance or um, harm. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, the book um, is organized to where in the first part of part one of the book, I'm really looking at the mechanism of how we're conditioned around race and racism. Um, and I'm speaking mostly to, uh, you know, a, a, a northern, a, a U.S. kind of base mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. in terms of my um, examples. But I think when people can recognize the template, mm-hmm. the shape, uh, the skeletal shape of oppression, they'll be able to see this wherever they are, mm-hmm. whatever country they live in. But what it introduces in part one is is that we look at ourselves as individuals, as good individuals, as all coming from families and, you know, being in systems of family systems where we had to negotiate belonging and love and we've all had losses and all had traumas. And so I established this kind of unifying, uh, you know, base of we're all good individuals Mm -hmm. and we're all so racial beings and um, when I'm looking at the individual part. So we all have inherent bias Mm -hmm. at the individual level of our being. And and, and we're all part of a racial identity group. And some of us know this and others of us don't. We're all, you know, we all come from a stream of racial... um, configuration and this kind of relative or kinship or relational world that we're in. Uh, and some of us, you know, uh, know this and some of us don't. And within this racial group identity, what we begin to recognize is that all races are not created equal. Some of them are dominant, dominating races and others are subordinated races. And so we take a look at the dynamics of racial group identity and how it plays together. Mm. Um, some of the ways we kind of uh, just, just, just as a collective, not as individuals again, but the collective momentum in our society that's 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 uh, that's a that has a rhythm and shape that we're all kind of entwined in that we can begin to discern. So in that section, I talk about six hindrances that get in mm-hmm. the way of us really seeing. Uh, we can first see ourselves in it and also see the collective potency of our group, racial group identity in it. And I think that's a real important recognition that can get us unhooked, uh, both at the individual level, but also to see uh, politically how we start to organize ourselves. And so much of this is already happening, by the way. Um, but we can begin to see the role we can play in collective momentum. And then at the institutional level, uh, what I try to point to here is how the uh, ins- many of the institutions are held by white folks, white men. And what we look at here is not so much the individual behavior, but the fact that at the end of, at the, at the racial group level, because whiteness has not been collectively vetted as a real dynamic in the racial narrative. Mm-hmm. You know, white people haven't come together to talk about whiteness, to figure out what that means, mm-hmm. to see what their role is, to see the historics of it. Usually that, that coming together is around how we, you know, how we understand other races, but it's not a lot of saturation um, uh, and momentum, if you will, at the racial group identity with white people to understand whiteness. So when we come together to have this conversation, we miss each other mm-hmm. because white white people bring an individual lens and people of color tend to bring a racial group identity lens. And so we're, our language and our experiences are not matching up uh, in a way that really um, penetrates the conversation in a deep way so that some healing can happen and some recognition can happen. Mm. 
Um, so that's a and so when the when the whiteness hasn't been really vetted, if you will, at the at the racial group identity, then it gets rolled up. The individualism gets rolled up into corporate life. It gets replicated. Uh, it gets played out. It becomes normative, uh, and all of the vacancies around our conditioning um, gets kind of um, it, um, uh, it is just not in the mix. So we can see how so many institutions, uh, you know, we we can talk about racist individuals. I don't usually use that term, even though I think there's some examples. But the racism lives at the institutional level because of the policies and practices Mm -hmm. and norms and blindness that are basically, you know, replicated through the leadership, which is mostly whiteness. Mm-hmm. So the institutions haven't really been established with people of color in mind because because there's no understanding of that. There hasn't been engagement around around that anywhere. So I'm pointing to the shape of individual groups and institutions and the dynamics that happen around our racial conditioning so we can recognize ourselves in it and begin to um, kind of explore through mindfulness, which is part two of the book, our understanding and where we get gripped and, and, you know, how we turn away and, you know, how we engage and where we get bruised. And so that's a piece of what um, is happening around this. That's what this template is, is trying to point out, our conditioning and how we can recognize ourselves and begin to shift our relationship with the stimulation mostly, or the numbness that gets activated when we start to have these conversations. Interesting, because, you know, I am, I'm reflecting that I think I'm much more accustomed to looking at these issues on an individual basis, you know, and using my, in terms of, certainly in terms of the use of mindfulness, you know, because Uh um, about, you know, I think about, um, I use this example in my most recent book, Real Love. You know, just about the assumptions that come up in our minds about others and the stories we tell, and then we just kind of fix them in that in that position. So this wasn't particularly about race, actually, at all. It was about class. And it was um, the story of a friend of mine who was on a book tour, and he was in the Midwest somewhere and um, gave a lecture. And in the course of the lecture, he mentioned that when he'd been a young man— uh, the writings of Marcel Proust have been very important to him, especially remembrances of things past. So he gave the lecture, and then he was at some restaurant having dinner, and this group of people approached him at the restaurant, and this one woman came forth, and he he looked at her, and he had the thought, oh, you know, she looks, like, poorly educated. She's probably not really very smart. And then she said, oh, I was at your lecture, so his heart sank, you know, like, what's she going to say? And then she said, I really liked your talk, but I just want to say that I get so much more out of reading Proust in the original French. Uh-huh. And he was like, oh, okay, you know, like, <laughs> I guess I got that one all wrong, you know. So, mm-hmm. and, you know, both mm-hmm. between looking at my own mind and, and helping people look at theirs, that's kind of the use of mindfulness I'm more accustomed to. Yeah, You know, what are the yeah. assumptions? What are the stories? What are your... Um, uh-huh. projections in this moment. Can you catch them? And uh, So I'm, I'm trying to understand what it means in terms of a system, what it seems, means in terms of an institution. Well, I, I, it, it's, you know, it, we ultimately come back to this inquiry mm-hmm. of what does it mean, how do I catch my assumptions, and, and so mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. But what enriches that process is, one, when we're, when we're dropping it into... Um, a contem- as a contemplation and really looking at how we're moved by this inquiry as mm-hmm. opposed, you know, to, you know, what, what our feeling tone is about it, where we get stuck and, mm-hmm. and hooked. But even more enriching, I think, is when we are engaging this out loud with other people that are in our same race. Mm-hmm. Because um, when that doesn't happen, then when we get in a room together, people of color end up having to educate white mm-hmm, people mm-hmm. on the impact of how they show up in the room, uh, hence your story, mm-hmm, <laughs> you know, so to speak. 
uh, even if it's a class story, because the dance of oppression or the shape of it is the same. We can pop gender in there. We can pop sexual mm-hmm. orientation. We're talking about race right now, but it's the same kind of crippled structure, mm-hmm. if you will. Mm-hmm. But I think what happens is when, 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 when we haven't done the work at the group identity level with our own race mm-hmm. uh, as an engagement strategy, as a structure that supports us deepening, then then the, 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 the conscious, you know, the, then people of color are always in this place where they're having to, you know, deal with their own activation uh, and educate white people about mm-hmm. how they're mm-hmm. showing up when white people can really do that on their own. Mm-hmm. They can get with other white people and figure this out. Mm-hmm. That's actually the thing that hasn't happened. And what I get real curious about is why hasn't it happened? Mm-hmm. And so in my work, I, it's a question I have. What's so hard about white people talking about whiteness? And what I get a lot are white people, you know, wanting to do the right thing. And, you know, I'm just using this gross level white people. I hope that's okay. It's yeah. just a way of looking, you know. But it's it's kinda like there there's uh the, the the information I get back often is I'm bored, I'm angry with them because they're taking too long, I'm frustrated, um, I don't feel anything. Um I feel better if we can just go join a cause that, you know, Black Lives Matter or what have you. so I'm not saying this all shouldn't happen of uh, joining another cause. But it's that territory of the the itch and the ouch and the 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 aversion to white people sitting around and working through that fog together, that funk together, uh, and really having that be a practice where their commitment is to stay and understand what that's about. Why is it so difficult? And, you know, and I just think that becomes real useful in deepening and connecting. Um, and it enriches and texturizes, uh, the, you know, the, the engagement that we could potentially have mm-hmm. uh, collectively. You know, and people of color need to be in, I, I call these racial affinity groups. Uh, and I spend a, quite a bit of time in the book talking about that. But people of color also need to be in racial affinity groups because what happens with us when we're so externally focused mm-hmm. on what's wrong, we don't have a chance to really know each other at the individual le- level because mm-hmm. we're so groupized, right? Which is necessary and important. But anytime we're kind of fixate, fixated in anything, we're, we're something's left out of the mix, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, we need to get together and figure out our membership and the presumed solidarity we have, the things we fast forward over, uh, what the hierarchy is among the body of color that where you know, like when, when black folks start talking about r- race and slavery, I mean, it kind of silences the whole room about uh, the, the whole body of color, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and I've had my Asians folks and Latinx folks say, you know, when you guys start talking about race, there's just no room for me. Mm-hmm. Or no, you, you know, and so we have to look at how we have created a sense of dominance and subordination among the body of color and work with that internalized oppression and, uh, you know, just kind of open up the lens to see what we have in common and to share, not just know it in our heads, but to really feel into a knowing of what this body of color represents so that we're not out thinking we represent um, people of color Mm -hmm, in general mm -hmm. term when we haven't really felt into that or know what that's Mm -hmm, about. mm -hmm. Uh, Or somebody's out there representing me without my consent, okay? This happens a lot in the body of color. There's some some voice uh, somewhere that represents um, all of the people of color, and that's a whole dynamic in itself, but... These are, this is some of the work that I think is yet to be done, and it has to do with us really examining our, our conditioning at the collective level with each other, mm. as opposed to it being an individual siloed practice. And I think we light each other up and help each other uh, deepen our intimacy with life. Our care has more more texture and meaning when we are engaging with it as opposed to hiding from that. And I think our practice of mindfulness was was made for this. It was made for this kind of suffering. 
Uh, so I get very excited about this intersection of racial distress and kind of ignorance and mindfulness because I think it really supports supports us. And it's time. It's it's time. It's you know this, the times we're living in is ripe for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I should say that you you wrote the book after quite some time of running this training program, right? And you still have the training program, so it's got the the book includes the lived experience of everything you learn from others and watch them learn and um it sort of reminds me a little bit when i wrote loving kindness which was my first book uh-huh. i'd been teaching loving kindness as a method of meditation for uh i guess by the time it came out i'd been teaching it for 10 years you know oh really i didn't know it was that long i knew it was going on though yeah and yeah. and so mm-hmm. it's it's kind of fascinating when you're uh, you're in a way chronicling what you've witnessed, you know. <laughs> That's right. So the things That's you're right. saying right now, you've you've watched. You've watched people go through. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, it's been. It was my practice to kind of be attending and really seeing the shape of all of this and the stories that people were telling mm-hmm. and what we had in common and you know all of the ways um the heart is really at the root of a lot of this there's a lot of caring Mm -hmm. um that we get all clumsy around be you know because it gets kind of clouded with with uh, fear and and you know self-interest but i think fundamentally fear and none of us want to feel bad about (laughs) about anything Mm -hmm. understandably and yet that's such a gateway such a such a way that we um know better and do better so, um, yeah, the training has been so beautiful, as you know, to to be able to just engage people mm-hmm. and just see what's true. It goes back to me, you know, when I first heard Jack Cornfield talk about know for yourself. I think that's really been a, a way that I've learned. It's been to engage. That's why I think the racial group identity, uh, racial affinity group piece is so important to me because when you're engaging, I know everybody learns differently. But for me, when you're engaging with other people to try to sort yourself out, you know, there's less hiding and there's more, if, if the structure's right, there's more, you know, of a coming out uh, that I think um, in that light, we can all see a little clearer. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a bit metaphoric, but I think you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, here's a quotation from your book. You say, racism is heart disease. Many of us can live for a while with a heart disease without knowing it. And others of us know we have a heart disease but are afraid or even in denial about it. But racism is a heart disease and it's curable. Uh Well, that's also hopeful, (laughs) you know. (laughs) Well, you know, part of this, Sharon, is I had a heart disease. I At 27, I had open heart Mm. surgery. Uh, You know, speaking of lived experience. Yeah. Okay, so... (laughs) You know, so, I mean, it was my, I mean, coming out of that surgery was my first silent retreat. Mm-hmm. You know, up until that time, I'd been running myself ragged and really just running from my life, running from the truth of, of, of just the raw material of, of our, <laughs> of existing, mm-hmm. you know, trying to find love in all the wrong places, you know, running hot, running, running crazy. Uh, and it was, it was, um, you know, I wasn't paying attention to the signals that the that my uh, mitral valve was trying to to uh, point out to me. It was a mitral valve prolapse mm. that was aggravated by a hyperthyro- hyperthyroidism, which was undiagnosed for so many years. So I just thought running around like that was just normal when I didn't realize how ill I was. Uh, so there is something about racism as a heart disease, because I, I grew up in an atmosphere of intense racial, racial, racial hatred in the mm. heat of the civil rights movement and, you know, black power movements uh, back in the early 60s in South Central Los Angeles. And, you know, there's a lot of trauma in my community, trauma in my family. You know, my father was um, killed when I, when, when I was 17 years old. Mm. I lost my father. You know, I had a kid in my teens. I was ill in my 20s with these surgeries. You know, so there's been all these ways that my heart has has been shut down, Mm. shrink-wrapped, 
ziplocked, you know, mm-hmm. relationships that, you know, just didn't have a chance because there was so much need uh, that I need needed external to myself to kind of feel like there was a sense of comfort. Um, and the idea of, of, uh, of me being able to figure that out on my own just felt so far removed. Um, so it's been a journey, and I think the heart has been integral to it. And and I think the heart is very involved around racial issues and racial distress. Um, I think our hearts are broken a lot. I mean, we all have different reaction to reactions to what we see in the world, different forms of protection. And um, when we start to thaw out, we start to feel in more to the heart, and that is to me, what's curative this, this in this practice, I feel of mindfulness it supports a certain softening and kind of a turning in and dropping in so that we can open wider to our lives and our inner interconnections in this life and how we impact each other uh, and get with understanding some of these you know kind of relational dynamics and collective dynamics that are in the world that are harming people. And, um, you know, address that, but in a wholesome way, in a wise way, Mm -hmm. in a very intentional way, instead of some of the reactivity where we get hooked and and go into places of harm. So I do think it's curable. I think I'm a living example of of that on some level. Uh, It is so nice to be able to look back on my life and see the changes, especially since I've been in this practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, that gives me more hope than anything. Uh, quite honestly, um, and it's not for everybody, I know, but it it is kind of a way to be more intimate with your life and more responsible. It just it just it it has forced me to look more ethically at each step I take, each action. I don't do it all perfectly, of mm-hmm. course, but I am more sensitive to being human and being connected. Mm -hmm. And I think the heart is kind of the the hub of it all, actually. One of the key tools you talk about um, as a prerequisite for this kind of transformation is the ability to embrace discomfort or abide in discomfort. I think anyone with a meditation practice appreciates that because it is such a, a skill that one learns, you know, the things we can be so afraid of feeling or acknowledging that are really the truth of our experience in that moment that we'd rather run from or deny, you know, sometimes that Mm -hmm. running or denial has such a cost that we're not calculating. Um, It's much easier, much, much more wholesome and kind of healing to just sit with the feeling. But to a non-practitioner, someone who, you know, is not experienced in meditation, it sounds a little weird, you know? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. why, why do you think this is so important to be able to, heal um, these sort of systemic issues? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think um, for me, uh, one of the things that I had to kind of face into, and I know a lot of people don't, but my way of doing things wasn't working, Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, um, my relationships weren't working. The job wasn't working. You know, my relationships with my kids, you know, my son wasn't Mm -hmm. working. You know, um, I, I I was doing all this efforting, and it was all for all the right reasons, but I was, you know, I see, I've seen too many people I care about, including in my family, e- even my great-grandmother, mm-hmm. who I saw pacing. At the, when I was seven years old, I remember vividly seeing her in the kitchen pacing with this apron, this dirty apron on. Back and forth, worrying, wringing her hands, outwardly worrying, mumbling, because she couldn't. She worried just, just ferociously about the fact that she couldn't take care of the black bodies that were in her family. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. she she couldn't fix it, and I couldn't comfort her. I remember that so vividly. I remember her pacing. She'd be happy to know I'm doing walking meditation now. <laughs> but I mean. <laughs> But she was pacing and worrying. There's a deal I made with myself then, I think, on some level where I said, I'm just not going out that way. Mm-hmm. You know, so I've seen so many people I love in, in out there working hard, mm-hmm. activists, artists, you know, uh, just, just people that are brave. 
out there doing this amazing work. And a lot of them are just dying on the vine, you know, mm. getting uh, diabetes and illnesses and, I mean, just imbalanced and unhealthy and worried uh, mentally, just fatigue. You talk about chronic fatigue. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about the, the chronic fatigue of, of, the, of the weight, the, the, the emotional labor required to live in this, in this light and the drain of spiritual wealth that happens when we're not able to um, take a minute and really look at how we're going about it. Mm-hmm. So, th- so I feel like it's crucial for us to examine the way we do what must be done. And, um, and some of us will get that, uh, you know, some of us have enough defense and righteousness, actually, to keep us strong enough or driven enough to keep that momentum going. But inevitably, I think we're, we short wire out the circuits. Uh, we die on the vine. We, we are living and we're dead right. Uh, and I'm just concerned about that. So I feel like there's ways we need to care about ourselves so that we can care about the world mm-hmm. in, a, in a more wholesome way. Um, I, I just think we're out of balance. Yeah. So part of that balance perhaps is sitting with the painful feeling and just acknowledging it for what it is. And part of it, um, are, are you saying I'm getting sort of as an implied comment is um, look for some joy, you know, or okay. appreciation or uh, kindness, something that will, you know, when you're looking at suffering your own or someone else's head on, um it seems to be that the the artfulness is all in the looking, you know, uh, because there we know, of course, there are plenty of people who are unhappy, and uh, the unhappiness leads to misery, you know, uh-huh. because of everything that surrounds it—a sense of isolation rather than community, and so on. And so, um, it seems to me that part of having the the ability to undertake this kind of work in the long term is is its own kind of balance, you know, which is also looking for the joy. Yeah, I think balance is definitely a piece of it. Um, and, and, and opening to the joy. Sometimes we can be so fixated on the object of what's wrong yeah, that we don't yeah. see that there's some beauty around it or mm-hmm. that, the, you know, that there's... Uh, a piece of gratitude over here that you just had this morning when you drank <laughs> that cup of coffee that yeah. you can kind of bring in to remind yourself of a broader kind of view. Um, mm-hmm. uh, because the narrowing can be, you know, it, it, it's not that it, we need that focus. I understand, you know, it took a lot of focus, as you know, to just mm-hmm. write a book and get yeah. it pointed. You know, you have to block a lot of things out. Sometimes that's exactly what we need to do. And other times we need to look around and both have gratitude for the support we do have and the beauty that is in our lives. And then just open to the simple ways that, um, that it flirts with, with us when, you know, mm-hmm. when, when we just open it up a little bit, you know, uh, a bit more of that. Yeah. A bit more of balance is, is, uh, I think really important for us. Uh, well, to go back for a minute, the reason I asked, uh, if you were working with corporations now, it's because I was curious if uh, you'd seen a change in that world between the diversity and inclusion work you were doing quite some time ago now uh, and now. Well, you know, my partner, my wife, is still in that work. Mm-hmm. Um, and, in, in, and in fact, it was part of her uh, model that I ended up you know, kind of living and breathing and, and through the course of our relationship, this individual group and institution and dominant and subordinate mm-hmm. racial group identities is, is uh, part of the work that she still continues to do in corporate America. I'm not in it so much. And it's so funny because uh, sometimes when she comes home and she talks about this work, which she's been doing yeah, 30, 35 years, it seems like it's just right, like right back at square one. It's like, is anything changed? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think sy- individuals can change a lot quicker than systems. Mm-hmm. And I think there are 
individuals that have changed. There's a lot more people that are aware, aware and a lot more people waking up. It's creating a sense of collective movement or mobility inside organizations. So changes are happening. It's just not at the bigger systems mm-hmm, level, mm-hmm. but you know how that goes. Kind of, yeah. They grow in these pockets. And I think I can see, I, I feel good about that kind of um, where, where I can see that happening. Uh, that, you know, uh, years ago, um, an astrologer told me about the, 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 the star that's in the sky that's called Chiron. And, uh, she, she said that for thousands of years it was there, but we couldn't see it as a people because we, there needed to be a collective consciousness before it could be revealed. And there's a way I feel like we're kind of on that edge a bit where mm-hmm. there's, there's enough of a collective consciousness happening that we can kind of see Chiron in the sky or we can see this dynamic enough to not go back to sleep. I think we're leaning in that direction for sure. Uh, and inside corporations, I think that's happening. It depends on the corporations. I think it's happening more in nonprofits than it is in mm-hmm. corporations that are still reliant on capitalism, which feeds a certain um, dominant subordination. I mean, it's just hard not to see that if that's the aim. Um, maybe it can happen. I don't know. But uh, I'm seeing I'm seeing. Uh, a growing number of individuals with power using their power in ways that supports change. Like there was this guy uh, that worked at um, um, at a bank mm-hmm. who uh, who was in a very senior position who decided that when the Florida hurricane hit, he was going to take a few trucks down there and support some of the people getting their things released and, you know, um, out of cleaning out their houses and everything. And while he was there, I, I write about this story in the book, while he was there, um, the uh, the senior legal people called him and said, you know, you're, you're out of, um, you know, you're, you're out of your jurisdiction. You need to return. This is not appropriate behavior for your leadership. And he tells them something like, well, if if you want to come down here and look at what I'm looking at and tell me we can't do this, then then I'll be willing to hear that I can't be here. Until then, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. You know, it was that kind of uh, choice that mm-hmm. he made. And then he never heard another thing from it mm-hmm. or, or about it. So people, I'm I'm hearing lots of stories about people taking these kind of risks with the power that they do have and nudging the system enough to where, you know, uh, it, it's the norm, but yeah, maybe we're not going to have that norm so much anymore, you know. Mm. So there's some of that, you know, that I'm seeing. Um, we need more brave people mm-hmm. willing to step outside of their comfort and their membership, especially with white people. First of all, there's a denied racial group identity. There's a denial of, of whiteness, but then there's uh, an investment in it because of the risk you're willing to take or not take to be in it or not. Mm-hmm. So I think there can be, that's when you know you're part of a racial group, a denied racial group identity, when you know if you do X, Y, Z, you're going to be a target or you might be mm-hmm. kicked out mm-hmm. or you might be you know not so favored. Uh, so all of that dynamic is going on in the context of the good individual without seeing that as part of a racial group norm. So I'm, you know, I talk about this a lot, and I know lots of people do, um, and I would hope that it's it's um, it's having some impact. And so if, if a lot of your work these days is with sanghas or communities of meditators or structures around that, right? Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then people uh, certainly seem by and large, not always, but but I think quite often come into those systems, into those um, groups because of the yearning for individual transformation. So uh, you're inviting them to expand beyond that. and. And yeah. translate that into a transformation of the larger group. Yeah, it's an invitation for um, people with individual power to use that privilege in a way that shifts a collective mem- momentum. Mm-hmm. 
um, where they can. It's, it's a way that the privilege can be used um, to um, in more wholesome ways or in ways that support well-being and non-harming, mm-hmm. you know. Um, yeah. And if I could just ask you about one phrase in the book, um, uh, for now, you use the phrase generational constellation of racial rage. Because when I first met you, you know, uh, you were known as the author of Healing Rage, mm-hmm. Women mm-hmm. Making Inner Peace Possible. And I think for our time, it would be uh, great, just as we finish our conversation before you lead a sitting, which would be wonderful, um, to talk a little bit about that and, and what that means and people, women facing their rage and, and making inner peace possible. Yeah. Well, um, rage, uh, again, was a, this healing rage was a training that I did for several years mm-hmm. before I wrote the book. And one of the things, one of the rage I, reasons I, one of the reasons I wrote the book is because I grew up with a lot of rage, uh, rage that I had to keep under wraps until I was grown. And then I, you know, was pretty blatant with it and, and even found a way to have a job where I can be legitimately angry and be well paid for it. You know, I mean, this is how, 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 uh, smart rage is. But I found that many women weren't so much blatantly angry as much as they were depressed or distracted with different addictions or, Mm -hmm. um, or playing it small or being devotional to people when out of, with a silent resentment or uh, being highly controlling. So I, in this book, I talk about these six disguises of rage that high functioning women tend to wear Mm -hmm. and, and how we got conditioned around, uh, being good girls or keeping ourselves small. And so I created uh, an environment where we could lose our minds for a little while mm-hmm. so that we can then rest in the space that got created from the release. So this, this, these, this training was more around, let's, let's have the cathartic around race, but then let's rest in the space and reclaim the space that gets created from that release mm-hmm. so that we can have, we can touch into a deeper truth and know what, and remember <laughs> what we've forgotten about who we are and how we really want to be. And also to recognize how we've been harming ourselves mm-hmm. uh, and how it's really not working. So, so this work, um, is rooted in a sense of generational unresolve because what gets uh, passed along to us energetically is what's unfinished with um, our, you know, with our parents and ancestors. So if we were raised in an environment where, you know, we didn't have a voice or we saw Mm -hmm. these dynamic happening and they weren't finished or cleaned up, then, you know, we're kind of left with how we elevate that, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, uh, with our generation, with our work, with our service. And so this this training, which gave birth to this book, is really about how we make inner peace possible in the sense of not um, making rage wrong, but really befriending it and attending to it and um, nurturing ourselves in ways that we were never nurtured. Uh, so it's got a psychological base to it. It also has a meditative base to it. And, uh, but it's about befriending and returning and cleaning up the, the, the karmic inheritance or the generational rage inheritance is how I, how I refer to it. Taking that to another level instead of it recycling and kind of repeating itself. It really sounds like a book for our time, which I guess is the mark of a really good book is that it's not time limited, you know, it's, it's not yeah. dependent on current events. Yeah. It it does seem timeless. Both rage and race seem yeah. timeless these days, right? Yeah. They certainly do. So thank you so much. Before we finish up, oh, yeah. I was wondering if you would lead us uh, in a brief meditation. Yes. Um, I'd love to offer something very simple, mm-hmm. uh, something that I uh, think is foundational for us uh, as we walk in the world, which is just a sense of... Um, uh, being still, 
uh, tapping into a sense of stillness in the body and movement with the breath. So we just want to settle. We want to turn inward here with whatever we're doing, just kind of drop in, drop down, and kind of open our heart and just kind of soften into the space that's holding us here. And then letting the flesh soften and the skeletal shape of the bones. Just allowing ourselves to know the experience of settling. To know the experience of settling. We might even want to place our hands on our chest and heart just to have a sense of contact, a bit of comfort. And as we pause here and just settle into a sense of ease and stillness without effort. Opening our awareness now to the stillness in the body. Maybe there's a place of stillness in the body that you can just rest your attention there for a moment. Softening into the stillness. Maybe it's in the volume of the legs or the in the hands. Maybe there's a sense of stillness in the belly, lower back, shoulders. Just opening the awareness to Rest in the stillness in the body. Allowing a sense of settling and ease to be known. Allowing the stillness in the body while you bring your awareness to the movement of the breath. The sensation of the rise of the breath and the fall of the breath. Really taking your time to experience the movement of the breath. in the stillness of the body. This movement, the sensation of the movement of the breath could be in the in the abdomen, in the chest. Maybe at the tip of the toes, 
or the tip of the nose. Very gently, allowing your awareness to simply be with the stillness in the body and the movement of the breath. Giving the stillness of the body and the movement of the breath, our priority. Softening, resting in awareness, You can allow a little joy to join you. Maybe a little curve at the end of the lips, feeling that on the inside. Resting, softening, open to the stillness in the body and the movement of the breath. And when you're ready, you can slowly open your eyes. And appreciation and gratitude. And with the prayer that 
may our practice be of service to all beings in the world without exception. May we grow in our awareness so that we can connect deeply with our humanity on all levels. May it be so. Well, thank you so much. Um, that's a great thing to listen to again and again. Um, and thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, it's been so lovely, Sharon. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, yeah. For the I'm, opportunity. I'm so yeah, glad it worked. so great. Yeah, me too. And me too. For, for our listeners, um, to learn more about Ruth King's work, visit www.ruthking.net, where she has lots of great resources and recordings. And if you'd like to dive deeper into the topics we discussed today, I would actually highly recommend both her books, Healing Rage and now the most recent one, Mindful of Race, which you can purchase in paperback and ebook formats wherever books are sold. So thank you. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening. To learn more about Sharon and her ongoing teaching schedule, as well as online courses and a free guided meditation, check out her website at SharonSalzberg.com.